how exciting it is to be back in Hyphen's Haven, the space for multi-hyphenate artists who work on stage and off in front of the camera and behind the scenes. We share our paths to becoming who we are. The spotlight for today is on the CEO and founder of Small Town Animated Studios and the Animation TV Network. He has over 15 years of character creation and storytelling expertise. His work includes the IP Gumshi, the Type 1 Protector, the Sunday Schoolers, and Animate My Life, as well as the 3D animated series, The Astronaut Club. And I just want to mention before we get going, I remember when I first started that I have been wanting to connect with an owner of an animation studios. And lo and behold, this past August, we were both selected to participate in the Black Root Parade, the Black Parade Root, excuse me, through the Bay Good Foundation owned by Beyonce. So we were both uh, selected in that. And I just want to introduce Jermaine Hargrove. How are you, Jermaine? Thank you. How you doing? I love that intro. Thank you. How you doing, Dre? I am great. I'm so thankful, grateful that you are here sharing your journey with us because I know some animators uh, who are in high school and in college wanting to pursue working in the spaces that you occupy. So I just, I'm so happy that you are here with us. So before we Thank get you. going, just know that we're going to spend some time uh, learning about who you are. And we always start at your foundation. So tell us about your parents or those you were raised by and, and what were their professions? How did they get into your spirit, built that foundation for you? Thank you. Um, so my parents was Lena, and Leroy Preston, um, you know, we, I grew up, my mom had many jobs. She had, you know, she was uh, a care worker, like a nurse, home nurse aide. She worked at a toy factory. Um, so you can imagine, you know, the start of it all, she used to bring different toys home. Um, she just had many jobs. And my dad was a policeman. Um, he had many jobs too. He worked, he drove a bus, the city bus. And, um, he had other several jobs. I, you know, I used to either take me to his job. Some things I didn't understand. And some things I'm like, oh, okay, you're a policeman. Oh, you did. So you're driving a bus. But he was a hustler for real. You know, I'm not, I don't use that word lightly. You know, of course, every man should have a job, but it was just more than that. It was in his spirit to have different forms of revenue. So he just did what, you know, whatever his hands could find to do legally. And when I say hustler, I don't want to make no mistake. Like he was out there doing some some dirt or something. He wasn't that, but it was just like he had so many jobs. And um, yeah, you know, and, and both my parents, you know, they instilled that in me at an early age to 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 be a go getter. You know, were you raised by uh, raised with siblings or any particular close uh, extended family members? Yeah, I was raised by my mom. And let me just say that too. We was raised in two, my mom we was in two different households. My dad, you know, that was early on after they split. I was with my mom most of the time and my dad on weekends, holidays, and just whenever he wanted, because it was still in the same city, whenever he wanted to come and get me and my brothers. Um, but my mom, she, she has a great spirit and she always took people in. You know, people still do that nowadays as colored people, black people, you know, we had such as having issues, having problems, give them somewhere to stay, they stay with us. So my mom, she always took people in. She took my Aunt Joyce in. She took my uh, my grandma, Inez, and, um, just different people. And, and my uncle Ronnie, he was definitely someone that raised me and my brothers. He was in the military a long time, stayed in Hawaii. And when after he got released, he was like, I don't know where I'm going to stay at. Not like he was just homeless, but my mom was like, hey, you come stay with us. And um, my Uncle Ronnie stayed with us many years. And just imagine all those different elements, uncle, grandma, my Aunt Joy stayed in the basement. And, you know, so it was it was it was something growing up. You know, I couldn't say I can't never say, hey, I didn't have any home training or nobody raised me. And I was raised by a single parent. To a point, I was raised by my mom. She was a single parent, but I had my dad on the side and different people that was in the household raised me and my brothers. Okay, well, take us to uh, your elementary school days. 
where did you attend and was there a teacher that first saw something special in you? Because sometimes those first teachers, they start to pick up on things and help uh, their students go into a particular area. Was that someone for you in elementary school? Yeah, in elementary school, there was two teachers, uh, matter of fact. Um, it was one that I can remember, her name was Miss Linden. And I had a crush on her, that's how I definitely remember her. Um, Cause she was like one of the first teachers that I seen dress out of the ordinary. And I'm not saying skimpy outfits or anything of that sort. I'm just saying she dressed at night. I said, wow, she, you know, as a young, as a young boy, I'm like, she could dress, but, um, but she always gravitated towards me and she used to encourage me so much, you know, as a black woman, I got to say that she was a black woman and she used to just, you know, she used to say something about me and, and encourage me. And um, I remember her like, like it was yesterday. Her name was Mrs. Linden. Now my music teacher, her name was, I think, I don't, want to mess it up. I think it was Sawarski, Sawaski, Mrs. Sawaski. She was my music teacher. And uh, she taught me the 50 states, uh, you know, United States. She sung it. We had to learn it. But she made sure that we, that's how I learned the 50 states. I'm being honest. You know, I didn't learn it in history. I learned it in music class. And she took our time. It wasn't just me. And I don't want to sound selfish. It was me. That group of kids that was in within that grade, she she spent time with them. She, you know, you're gonna learn it. You can learn it, encouraging us. And um, I gotta give them that. I still remember them to this day. I hope they're still alive. But um, yeah, those two teachers really encouraged me and pushed me. How awesome. We love to give a shout out to teachers that yes. help to nurture those early talents. Now yes. let's transition to middle school. Uh, I know that that's when, you know, things start to grow in certain areas and you being an owner of an animation studio, is that where you first started to really get into that drawing talent? Nope. And nope. I tell people this, and that's the funny thing about it, because when I speak on panels and I speak on these animation panels and everybody be, hey, I used to collect comic books and I used to do this. I like, my gift didn't come to later on, but okay. So you say middle school? Yes. So middle school, and by the way, I went to Chancellor Avenue School in Irvington, New Jersey. And um, one of my classmates was Prize from the Fugees. Let's just say that. <laughs> Prize from the Fugees, and I always say that because he's still a good friend of mine. Prize from the Fugees, we, that was me, him, and a bunch of other people used to hang out. He used to stay right up the street from me. And during those days, it was, I got introduced to people coming up to the school wanting to fight for whatever reason. Um, I won't say gangs. We didn't really have gangs like that in New Jersey, but in middle school, it just seems like I was in that, that era was people used to come up to the school, take your sneakers. And like, I experienced bully. Is that a word? Bullyism? I don't know, but. Or bully, bu being bullied. Not me per se, but I used to bully me and my brothers. And I'm not talking tough, but I'm just saying at that time, they used to bully people and we used to, come to their rescue, me and my brothers and my, my, my friends in, in within that class range and, and prize from the Fuji's, you know, he was one of the ones, you know, he's Haitian and I'm not putting his business out here or dogging him, but you know, that's how we met because we kind of met within that school grade, like, Hey, leave him alone. You know, they picking on him or whatever, but middle school was real interesting. And, and I wasn't nowhere near thinking about animation or anything like that. I was kind of like into music again, just the whole music era. I was a real, I think break dancing was out around that time. I wasn't, you know, but I still had that. I think Star Wars was out around that time. Different things I still took notice of. And I'm like, hey, I like that. But it wasn't no passion just yet in middle school. Okay. Well, let's transition to high school, because as you are growing physically yes. and spiritually, uh, was there a teacher in high school that really started to say, hey, you have a particular gift. Let's yeah. unearth that. Yeah. Now that, yes. Now, high school. Now, that's where it kind of my gift started to flourish. Um, it was was one teacher was a math teacher. and We started off on on a bad note. She, I used to be a class clown in high school. Um, so just for, say for instance, I used to go into class and start sucking my teeth and, um, everybody else would start doing it. 
And the teachers, she used to see me as the leader of that. When I do stuff, I used to knock on the wood under my desk, knock on the wood. Then everybody in the class would be knocking on wood. So she she figured out I was the leader of that, and we became enemies. And, I, and when I say enemies, a grown woman should be an enemy of a child, per se. And she used to let me have it. I don't know if that was if school pilot. I don't know if that was legally or what, but she used to she used to let me have it, you know. Uh, lightweight cuss. She never put her hands on me, but she used to. You ain't gonna be nothing, and you gonna die at an early age, oh. and you want. But it was just one of those days, you know, what me and her. Where I kind of just like, man. I mean, I'm gonna knock this stuff off. Like I'm, you know, I got bigger goals out here. I ain't trying to be no class, labeled as a class clown. And I just started stopping all that mess I was doing, and we became real close to the point where I used to leave my class and other class, I used to go check up on her. Like, I'm gonna go check out such and such before I go to my class. She used to be happy to see me, we used to hug one another. And um, she was the one that instilled in me like, you going, it's something about you. That's mainly, and I'm not gonna say about, a lot of people say, hey, you gonna be, you gonna win Grammys or you are gonna be the next president. Nobody really came at me like that. They just always knew. They kept saying, hey, it was, it's something about you. Something about you, I can't pinpoint it, but you're gonna be good in life. You, you know, you're gonna be somebody basically. But it was, I don't know her name. I don't even want to try to make a name up, but it was my math teacher in high school. Okay. And you mentioned that it was in high school that you started to really yeah. get into your art. Was there yeah. like some particular event that's yep. like, whoa, let me just take a further look into this space? Yeah. So I was in, you know, I took shop in um, high school. And in shop, you know, we got assignments to make different things. So I just decided to be one of them hardhead kids and do my own thing. I started trying to be an inventor in shop, trying to make what I want to make. And, and I was failing and everything. I didn't care. But I was like, you know, my gift was act, acting. Then I'm like, I'm about to make something out of this. Whatever the lesson is, I'm not doing that. I'm trying to invent something. And um, that's when my gift, gift flourished. And that's when... Uh, it was so many movies out around that time um, and all that stuff started to impact my life. And I was like, I'm a, I'm a creator. Like, I, that's just what it is. I can't fight it no more. I'm thinking about different stuff in different classes and I'm seeing stuff different. I'm looking at stuff people got on. Uh, I would do it like this. I would design that like this because I was a designer too within high school and, and like a beginning stages of a design streetwear. And um you know, I was just looking at things different. So it's in high school was when that gift really flourished. And my thinking was like different. I was considered like a nerd. Um, what they say, a nerd, you know, and Pharrell, people like Pharrell and Kanye and different ones. They say, hey, I was the nerd. Yeah, I was that to a certain point. I had street friends, but I was the one like, hey, I want to join Boy Scouts and I want to do this. I want to you know, I'm like, I'm doing stuff out of the ordinary that black kids don't normally do. I'm interested in that stuff, going to camp. And I'm like, you going to camp? You're going with them, you know, per se, the white people? I'm like, yeah, I'm going. I want to go. So that's when it kind of flourished during those times during high school. Okay. So as you are about to transition out of high school and you are getting some ideas and spaces that you should focus on, uh, what influenced you to go towards that next path like what it's like oh i need i think i need to do this what was that um rap music because rap music around that time it was like storytelling slick rick was like one of my favorite rappers uh big daddy Kane. like all those ones back then they used to tell stories they don't so much do it now but they used to tell stories and those stories used to be like nas they used to be like wow that I could visualize that story and I just kind of got heavily into the music and that's how I uh, transitioned into songwriting. So songwriting is you telling the story without a visual. So that's what made me start songwriting um, on the music side. And, um, you know, and I was always told if you could songwrite, you could write a movie, you could write a script, you could write greeting cards. But um, that's where that element came in that uh, actually create being a creative or the songwriting element. Okay, and is this something that you work with a particular company to yeah, start? I work with a, yeah, I work with a, um, a company. Well, I was working with Sony Sony Entertainment at the time, Sony Music. 
And, um, you know, I, I just started professionally writing behind the scenes, doing stuff with different, with different people or whatever. And um, yeah, that's how I got into the whole creative thing of, of songwriting. So that is so cool that you are working with Sony yep. and you are writing out of high school. How, how long did you do that or work with Sony in that space? I worked with Sony over 12 years. Um, yeah, but yeah, you're right. It was like probably like right out of high school. Um, but it, it was like a short amount of time as far as on the writing stuff. And then I started doing other stuff within the music business, um, of rapping, um, managing, and all of that stuff. So I, I was like heavily into the music. That's The music side is what prepared me for the entertainment side. That's one that I'm doing is now. so cool. Like, how did you even get into that space? Because that's a significant space. I don't want to gloss over that, but that's- I'm talking about the songwriting. Working in, like, how did that happen? You went, you go from high school yeah. and you had to connect with somebody. Yeah. So I connected with, I don't, and I don't want to put that person out there, okay. but it was a high powered executive. I don't want people to spam them, but it was a high powered executive, well known. And um, they took me up under their wing and they basically, I, they was mentoring me. Okay. And um, then I was managed by this individual wife. I was managed by her and I was with them, you know, with this particular, this person, I don't want to name them, but um, yeah, that's how I got my, my start in the whole music uh, business. Okay. So now as you are working 12 years in that yeah. space, writing, how did you begin? How did you, that transition had to come about that you yeah. were starting to focus your attention on art and drawing? What happened yeah. to influence that decision? Okay. So while I was doing the music stuff, again, this goes back to what I said a few minutes ago, I, I was a streetwear designer, fashion. I was always into clothes. So you know, and those, they come hand in hand, drawing designs uh, for fashion and drawing characters to kind of like hand in hand. I'm not a good character to draw, but I could draw, you'll know what it is. If I draw an elephant, you'll know it's an elephant. It might not be up to par, but if I hand it off to somebody there, spiffy it up and like, okay, yeah, Jermaine drew this, but I just, uh, you know, made it better. So I was one of those kind of like a draw, draw whatever I want to draw to a certain point. And um, I wanted to add the story writing uh, uh, part to that. So me drawing characters and then me adding the story writing, that's an, that's animation right there. It's like, you know, without even moving, because it could be children's books, it's still cartoonish. And um, I just didn't know how to make the transition because again, it, was, it wasn't hardly a lot of black people, even now in animation, in cartoons and stuff like that. So I didn't know where to start. So I was just kind of, just playing around with it, it while still in the music business. Wow, that's amazing. So how did your first major work come to you as you are, okay. you have this 12 year background of writing and now you're 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 into street wear design and just put meshing these talents together. So what was that first major work? So the first, first major work I did a deal with the clothing line pure players it's like streetwear brand um and i remember and i can say it because i don't i think they closed down now but it was like a 1.5 million dollar deal um I, mean, I, I negotiated that deal and everything but it just it didn't go through but that was like my first as far as getting into fashion streetwear then seeing people taking me serious like oh if this could be something um so that was my first my uh that offer from that uh clothing brand I'm going, we're not going to gloss over that. You are, you said you negotiated on yeah, your own that contract. Yeah, I did. Over you, I did. When you did that. And I could probably say that I negotiated on my own. Um, you know, I did a photo shoot with them and everything. And um, it just didn't go for whatever reason. God got the last say so, you know. Um, but yeah, that that was big because for me doing that, I got with uh Carl Kana, um cross colors. And I got with them because the person that was working with uh, the Pure Place people, when that kind of folded, they went to Carl Kana and I had a great relationship with Carl Kana, the clothing brand, and Cross Colors. Um, you know, the people, they kind of, you know, even with fashion, they, everybody kind of know everybody. They be going to, from one company to another. So I just built great relationships. And then I used to do, I call my people from Carl Kana, like, hey, this person shoot a music video, send them some clothes. Hey, let's do a collaboration with this 
this group of people and, you know, it could have Clark and I on it and their logo, send it to them. So I was just like building myself as that person, the go-to person as a businessman and for people to take me serious. And you did all this still in New Jersey or you had moved yeah. to still no. in New Jersey? Still in New Jersey. I didn't move to, to Georgia until 1999. That is really cool. And what brought about that move to uh, Atlanta? So, you know, when you go through so much stuff in New Jersey and we skipped over a whole bunch of stuff, I experienced tragedy. My brother died, got murdered. Um, you know, like I said, I might have been the nerd type, but I still had street people around me, you know, my element or whatever, the block that I grew up on, my brother. It was like a whole bunch of mess. Uh, and I don't want to incriminate nobody, but it was just a bunch of mess. And I was like, you know what? I, I got to get up out of here, you know, because I, I see where this was going. And I was, my attitude was like, hey, either somebody going to kill me or I'm going to kill somebody. It could be self-defense. It could be you keep making sure that you don't kill me. But I just, you know, it's a feeling when you in that element, it's like something's bad going to happen. I got to get up out of here. So the, I, I wanted to move to Hawaii. Um, my whole, see, like I said, we skipped over a bunch of stuff. My whole dream was as a kid growing up, middle school, high school, like I'm going to move to Hawaii. Like I was in my mind embedded. I was going to go to college in Hawaii. I was going to move, but it just never happened. But I, I really wanted to move to Hawaii. But yeah, I chose uh, Georgia. Okay. And as you have come to Atlanta, uh, what major work came about in the city that kept you afloat? so that you wouldn't have to turn back home. So the thing now, the thing with Atlanta, it, you know, it's so different now than back then. Everybody's moving. So, you know, I was kind of still in the music business in Atlanta. Um, you know, I got with LaFace, uh, you know, just different things. I was still doing stuff in Atlanta and I was still touring with people and still, you know, writing and, you know, making money, but my heart wasn't in it no more um, because I seen a bigger world. Um, for the music business, I used to actually tour. Um, so I've been places and I've seen the world and I'm like, you know, I can't, I can envision, like they say, sky's the limit. Like this ain't it right here. I'm always thinking further. I'm always thinking bigger. People would say I think too big now because like I experienced so much. But in Atlanta, you know, I just got around a bunch of people that kind of thought like I thought, like, wow, this is like, now I see why people want to move even nowadays. It's like it's like a mecca, it's like a hub of black people wanting to tr they not scared to try things and and move forward, like start businesses. You got women it's like, so, like so, such as yourself, got businesses. It's like, wow, this it's not like that up north. It's, you know, I'm not saying they don't get money in, in New York and New Jersey and all that, but in the South, it's just like a different, different kind of vibe of entrepreneurship. That's cool. So uh, since you've been in Atlanta uh, since 1999, how did you get set up for your studio? Okay, so 1999, so um, I think it was 2000, maybe 2003, 2004. I wanted to make, I was setting to make the transition from music to animation. Around that time, I got diagnosed with diabetes and um you know, it was a bad situation. I almost died. I was in ICU for five days. My my blood glucose levels was at 1100. And the third day in ICU, that's when I came up with Gumshi, which was a different name at the time. And um, I said, you know, now is the time to, you know, I don't want to get spiritual. I want the, the, the uh, viewers to be like, no, get it. Know, but I got to talk about the Lord, you know. Yes, go ahead. The third day in ICU, the Lord began to deal with me and say, because I, I began to deal with him. I say, if you get me out of this, because it, it the doctor didn't even know. He was like, it's, we don't know. You, you, he, you, you may die. It was bad. You know, I don't know if you know about diabetes, but at the glucose level at 1100, people die and stroke out at four, five. For some reason, and I know my purpose now, the Lord, let, it miles was 1100. I couldn't breathe barely. I couldn't, the inside of my mouth was like, and I, I'm, and I'm being real graphic because I want people to see this and want to take care of their health, better care of their health. So 
inside of my mouth was sticky like crazy glue. Like, you know, when you see these zombie movies and you open your mouth and then you see that piece of saliva go up, that's how my mouth was. Inside of my mouth, all my saliva just got gluey. It was bad. So anyway, so I was in ICU. They didn't know if I was going to live or not. But the third day, the Lord began to deal with me. I had to pray and pray and pray and say, Lord, let me live through this. And um, he gave me the vision for, for Gumball. But the, well, the, the original name was Gumball Girl. That was the original name for my um, for Gumption. And I said, okay. Then I had he gave me another vision. It was called Fancy Feline. It was an animation with cats, just like the movie Grease. Um, it was like with different cats, different species of cats, but a musical. So I began to work on that. I began to work on Gumption. Well, think about it while I was in there. And I said, you know what? I'm going I'm to start my own studio. I'm going I'm to get into this animation thing. Because I already had a passion for Star Wars and all those kind of movies. I'm like, I want to get into the film business. But didn't know how. I didn't want to do film. I want to do cartoons. So it didn't happen right away. Even then, I got out of ICU. And I guess the Lord wanted me to focus on my health first. Because it was like a struggle with diabetes, trying to maintain it. I didn't know what it was. So I had to focus on that. I had to, it took me months to get it right. My sugar was either high or it was low. It was high or it was low. It wasn't really in between. It was like, okay, you got to do something. So it took me a while to kind of get it together. And, <clears throat> and then, um, you know, fast forward a few years after that, like I said, it was just like, it was all about my health then living. I went on a living spray per se. They say, you got to live. I don't know what tomorrow going to hold after going through that. I wasn't really focused on nothing but living. So when I finally got that together, I said, you know, I got to find some way to crack into this animation business, this industry. So I start looking, looking and looking online, looking, see if I could intern somewhere, looking. Because, you know, Cartoon Network, I don't know if it's still there now, but it, it was, um, yeah, so it was in Atlanta. Um, so I began to talk to some people there, too. Uh, but nothing didn't work out. It didn't take me serious. Again, the, the black thing. And that's what it was. I'm, I'm not calling them racist, but it was like, okay, a lot of black people wasn't not interested in this. So, you know, they kind of ignored me, basically. I would say that. They kind of ignored me and what I wanted to do. So I found one company. It was a company in the Philippines. And um, it was an animation company. And I just, and the Lord led me to them because I, I wasn't really looking outside international. So I found one company and um, I said, hey, I'm Jermaine. I come from Sony. Um, you know, I want to like to intern. I would like to work with you and on, on uh, everything, the animation stuff. And they was like, wow, Jermaine, you hit us up at the right time. And I said, you know, why so? They was like, we just finished a brand new animation movie. And um, I said, OK, they said, do you have connections in the U.S. with celebrities? I said, yeah, I do. They said, well, we're going to send you the full movie. We want you to uh, uh, produce it. We want you to be the producer and everything, handle everything for the U.S. and Canada. So I said, okay, these people don't know me from a can. This must be God. These people don't know me from a can of paint. I could have bootlegged it or whatever. They sent me the whole full animation movie on Blu-ray and through the email. And I had to download it. And um, I was like amazed, like, wow, this movie is, and it was good. It was a good movie. It was it was like a gaming movie for kids before esports really got to where it's at. Now it was a, a gaming movie, and um, the guy said, oh, "I said okay, I'll do it." The guy said, "Who can you get to be in this movie to do the voiceovers?" I said, mm. "I said I'm gonna get Michael Jackson kids to do it." He was like, "I said yes, sir, yes, I'm gonna get Michael Jackson kids to do the voiceover, be the main character for this movie." He said, "Okay." Uh, let me know how that go. And I said, man, you know, I wasn't regretting it, but I was like, like I said earlier, I'm a, I think big. It wasn't a lie, but I was going to attempt to do it. So I'm using my business contacts, using my business contacts in the industry. And I came across Michael Jackson lawyer, which is Catherine Jackson's lawyer, which is she had the kids at the time. So I emailed him and I said, Hey, I'm Jermaine. I'm, I'm the producer of this movie. I want to get Blanket Paris. I don't know the other boy name. I said, I want to get the Jackson kids to do the voiceover for this movie. 
And at that time, I was the very first person that actually came at them for something like cartoon, which is animation. And the lawyer was just like so excited. So he said, okay, let me get back with you. I'm thinking he's going to, like, like I told you about cartoon never, I'm thinking he's going to push me off, like whatever. He hit me back in two days and said, hey, I just spoke to Catherine. I showed her what you sent me and she's excited. Can you come to Beverly Hills next week? Not next month, not in three months, three weeks or whatever, next week. And that ain't no cheap ticket. I said, okay, yeah. You know, and I told him, yeah, not and me and my partner at the time, I said, you know, yeah, we're gonna go out there and meet with Catherine. I'm like Catherine, Catherine Jackson, Michael Jackson mom, yes. And um, you know, we booked everything, went out there, and this the short, this the short form, because I know we for time, this the short form, but we went out there, yeah, we went out there and you know, we stayed somewhere by Beverly Hills. At that time, we couldn't afford to be like, all right, we're going to stay in Beverly Hills. Like, mm -mm. we stayed not too far from Beverly Hills. It was maybe like five miles, seven miles or something. But we drove to the um, to the Beverly Hills spot. And, um, you know, we rented out the room downstairs. No, we didn't rent it. They told us we could use the boardroom uh, for a meeting because we were staying. Uh, somebody was staying there. Something that I can't barely, uh, barely remember that part. But... For some reason, they let us use the boardroom so I said, meet Catherine. So we go, in, we, we go in there, and I see Catherine Jackson. I'm starstruck. I've been around celebrities before. I don't been around. This is just the name of a few. I don't been around Mariah Carey, uh, Tupac, um, so many different celebrities, Beyonce, Destiny's Child. Been around at before, before the Catherine Jackson thing. But when I seen... Catherine Jackson, my mom went back as a kid, like, wow, this is Michael Jackson mom. She came in there with security. And uh, security was like, hey, which room? We like, hey, it's over here, this room over here. And you know, they was on point, making sure that we are who we say we were and we wasn't gonna do nothing to them or her or rather. So she had security and we got in the room and I introduced myself. I'm like, hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm Jermaine. Um, and then the lawyer was like, yeah, this is Jermaine I was telling you about. And, I, and my partner was like, hey, I'm Randy. And he was like, hey, yeah, every time we say something, the lawyer uh, uh, kind of like uh, said again, like, yeah, that's red, I guess for security purpose. So she looked at us, she was like, wow, Jermaine and Randy, she was like, wow, she's like my children. We didn't think about it. I didn't think about it like that. I'm, I'm, my name's Jermaine. I'm not, you know, so I'm like, wow, this is like a so, this it felt like we in a movie. Um, so, so we sit down, the projector on, and we put, I put the trailer up. And, um, you know, I had some unreleased scenes that we didn't show her in the email. And she was just like, oh, yes, yes. Yeah, we'd love to do this. They would, Paris, they would love to do it. And I'm like, oh, before that, I will say this too, because I want the, the, the viewers to know this. And I don't mind saying it because we all made mistakes. So before we, when we sat down, I, I told the lawyer, I said, can I talk to you for a minute? He said, yeah, sure. I said, over here. I didn't want to talk in front of Ms. Jackson. I said, um, you mind if I, would she mind if I take a picture with her? He said, I don't think that'd be a good idea. I said, man, I played myself. I wasn't really taking a picture for myself. I thought about my mom, like, just as a, you know, my mom being proud, like, wow, my son, you know what I'm saying? It's one thing to say I met with Captain Jackson, but I want my mom to see it like, look, it's Captain Jackson. So I, I took all my ego out of the way because that's how I really felt. I've been around celebrities and I'm just like, hey, they're just a celebrity. But I push all my ego to the side. Like, I got to get a picture with Captain Jackson. I may never get this opportunity again. It's Michael Jackson, mom. And um, I played myself. I should have kept it business. And um but he was like, I don't think that'd be a good idea. I was like, my, I felt this small when I did that. Because first I was like, oh, yeah, I'm Jermaine. I'm studio. I got this animation movie. And I'm going to be the first to put the kids in it. But when I asked that one question, oh. as, a, as a fan, I felt this small. So we walked back to the, that's, we walked back to uh, where everybody else was at. And then that's when I started showing her everything. But the mood was still there because she didn't know I asked just him. So the mood was still, she was excited. She was happy and everything. 
And then she said, yeah, we want to do it. So we work out everything. Let's work out. Lori like, hey, give me a car next week. Let's work out everything. But that didn't work out because just, just imagine me, my little old self, me and my partner, our company, dealing with the Michael Jackson estate, <laughs> dealing with the Heal the World Foundation, dealing with so many people that's attached to Michael Jackson that feel like everything that 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 is attached to him and his kids, they want a piece of. So I said, no way. I just get, I just got diagnosed with diabetes. I'm not finna kill myself over the situation, stressing. And, you know, I got to think about my health. It, it became too much. And I said, you know what? This is too much, and it's not even my IP. Like, I'm going to go back in the hospital and have a stroke, a heart attack or something, and this not I don't even know this. This is not even mine. So I said, okay, no. So we kind of mixed that situation off. Everybody went their separate ways. And from that day on, I know it was a long, but that was a short story, the short form rather. That's when Small Town Animation Studios was started because I said, you know, I got to do my own thing and um, do what I want to do, make my own decisions. And I don't have to kind of be dealing with people like, hey, they got my 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 uh, career in their hands per se. What an amazing story. That's the short form. I just kind of the short form of sped it. it up. But yeah, shout out to um Catherine Jackson and the lawyer. I don't want to make it seem like I don't want Jermaine Jackson or any one of them to see that like, hey, he tried to use my mom as clickbait. No, this is definitely a real story. Um, me meeting with Catherine Jackson for the movie, uh, the animation movie. But I don't tell everybody, but it's been so many years, you know. I figure I want people to know my my start of of professional stuff in the animation business. So I tell it on this platform. All right. So that was the moment, that situation, this yeah. birth, small town animation. Yeah. Was Studios. there it was there a particular area in town where you set up your office or where did you start working for your company? Yeah, I'm, again, it's one of those situations you gotta fake it till you make it. Like, you know, I'm probably like I'm in my office now. Then I didn't have an office. It was, you know, um, and I watch a lot of those movies from back in the day how people started and it was like, hey, my office was in my kitchen. That's how it was. I didn't really have an office. We was kind of winging it. And, um, you know, just doing stuff. Everybody was in their own homes and, you know, just my animators. I had animators in Chicago, um, but we was just kind of winging. I didn't even have an office at the time. You say you have animators now, but how did yeah. that connection even go like you are starting your company yeah. so there had to be a point that you had to start hiring people what what yeah. happened in that transition from i'm starting my company formally to okay it's time for me to hire people okay so you know i speak on panels now thank god people want to hear from me. they want to hear my story such as yourself they want to hear from me and uh, people book me all over to speak on panels so I started speaking on panels about my life story, about animation, about being a black owner in animation. And, you know, from speaking on these panels, I meet so many people, animators, basically. They be like animation platforms besides your, your platform, but they be like tech, animation. And people be like, hey, I want to I work with you, Jermaine. You, you, you know, okay, send me your information. Let me see your resume. You got a reel. So... You know, so many people I met over that time where I got a whole catalog full of animators. So when I say animators, a lot of people don't know the lingo. It's illustrators, it's modelers, it's riggers. When you say animation, that's just one term of what people do to make an animated movie. It could be uh, the music supervisor. But everything animation, I have a whole Rolodex uh, catalog with everybody information to say, hey, I can hire X, Y, and Z for this project. I can hire X, Y, and Z for that project. And that's how I start bringing on animators and forming my team. So that's how I did that. Oh, awesome. So now that you're in your space, this is, it's, it's good. Now we are growing and growing. Yeah. Can you give us an idea of like, what's a typical day or what's the day in the life of Jermaine? What's that like? That's a great question because I'm, I always say that to people. I say, yeah, you don't know what I go through in life. You don't know what my day is like when I sometimes I forget stuff. I, my mind is always, I'm a creative. So I might be thinking about a script when I'm talking to you and I'm like, okay, I'm sorry, what you say? Like, that's just how creators be. But my day is, you know, definitely and thank the Lord 
for uh, you know waking me up. I start off with the Lord and I end with the Lord. So you know, let's say that that's very important. I recognize who's waking me up, and who's you know putting me to sleep. Um, so, but that time in between, most of the time, I'm either uh, my right now, like my day consists of a bunch of meetings because we have the network and we got the studio and we have several projects and we have several partners that's trying to partner with us on these projects and, and that we're trying to partner with too as well. So a day in the life for me is a bunch of phone calls, a bunch of Zoom meetings, a bunch of script writing, a bunch of character development. Like I'm really on my um animation stuff now, like I animate. So I'm really trying to teach myself this new, it's a new animation software and I don't want to name them. But it's a new animation software that's how I'm really pushing myself. Like I'm a, I'm gonna learn this myself. I'm not taking no classes for it. So that may take up four hours of my day. Um, but that's for the most part. I don't have regular eight hour days. My days be 10 hours, 12 hours, sometimes 15. And I know, and I'm not advocating that. Let's be clear, because I'm a diabetic. They say you have to get your sleep. But yes. sometimes I could be hard headed in that sense because it's like. Man, I I, I ain't I got I need at least two or three more hours. It may be twelve o'clock. I'm like, I right, I'm a time myself. I'm gonna go to bed at three o'clock. Um, then I gotta wake up again at six or seven and do the same thing. But I do take vitamins. I'm gonna say that. And this, you know, I'm real specific of what I say because people, you know, I did a I did a speaking thing at JBL Audio for Black History Month and for all the employees at JBL. This is this is on the same subject, but. The lady, it was an older lady there. It was a black lady. She'd been in the company for a long time. She said, Jermaine, you know, she was encouraging me. I said, um, I said, oh, I'm going to say this. Can I say this? Can I say that? Because we did a rehearsal. She said, you know what, Jermaine? She said, I know your type. She said, you know, just be careful of what you say. Because when you say something, it's believable. If you exaggerate something, it's believable. Because of my attitude, I talk with confidence. So that's why I keep saying, let me say this and let me say that. I'm not advocating not getting no sleep because people will be like, hey, I'm going to do what Jermaine's doing. I'm going to, you know, they got, he he has that no sleep attitude. Like, no, I'm not saying that. You better get yourself some sleep. I'm just saying sometimes, but I will take power naps during the day. I may take an hour here, half an hour there, whatever, and it helps. But I'm not advocating for no sleep. But that's what my day consists of a lot of meetings and a lot of, put together these projects because most of the projects I'm the director, producer, the writer. I do got a team, but it's my vision. So, you know, I got to be hands-on with everybody. So for those uh, young professionals, high school students, you know, they are listening, yes. um, collegiate students who want to work in a space like yours, are there some essential tools that you have that you want to share to help them get to a space like yours? Yeah, one of the things I will say, you have to do your research. You know, it's that's very important because a lot of stuff that's for your good is hidden. You know, let me say it again. A lot of stuff that's good for you is hidden. And it won't make it that good if it was just for everybody. You have to find, like when they say, connect with somebody, make connections. You know, so I'm basically saying that. You, you have to do your research because a lot of tools that you need, I may forget to tell you the tools, but if you research, you will find them. So my tool is to tell you to make sure you do your research. Try to research every day and put a time limit on it. Don't say, oh, I research for 20 minutes and that's it. No, you may have to research for three hours before you find what you're looking for and it be helpful to you. So that's one thing I will encourage all teens, kids coming out of school, trying to get into their career path. A lot of people is not going to mentor you. You got to mentor yourself, you know? And that's one thing I, I made, I was, I was, I made that mistake. I was looking for a mentor growing up, looking for a mentor. Like I said, my dad, again, we didn't get into all the logistics of my life, but my dad died at an early age. So it was a void there that was missing. I was looking just like everybody else. They'd be like, I'm looking for a mentor, mentor. Sometimes you got to mentor yourself. Your mentor is your computer, the resources, Google. Google be your mentor. I right, Google, what today? I'm looking for this today. Tell me, show me, Google. How can I, what can I do to make this money? What can I do to pay these taxes? Or how can I save money? Google, tell me. 
Google could be your mentor. So that's one of the main things, resources. Find your resources and stop always looking for someone to tell you. A lot of people is not going to tell you. They like you say, give up game. They're not going to give up game for whatever reason. I don't mind telling you if I know, um, because I believe that's what my purpose is, to encourage and inspire. But everybody, if you don't come in contact with people like myself, don't be mad when people say, I don't have time to mentor you. That's just the mentality of a lot of people. Just mentor yourself to a certain point. And then if you're doing a good job of mentoring yourself, you'll get around somebody that say, hey, take me down my number. Call me anytime. They don't necessarily have to say, hey, I'm a mentor you. That's basically them telling you that. That's your mentor. Just call me anytime. Ask me anything. So, you know, just look at the, the words between the lines of, you know, mentorship and resources and stuff like that. And you mentioned uh, working with mentors and, you know, uh, sometimes it's a challenge getting yes. a, a mentor. And I, I yes, get that. Is. But as far as you as an individual, are there some artists that you would love to work with or even just professionals as you continue on your path of creating great art? Yes, great question. Um, you know, I say this during my panel speaking sometime, they'd be like, who who would you like to work with? Who who did you look up to? I looked up to people like Spike Lee. You know, again, it's a lot of it's not a lot of black filmmakers, and I'm not insulting nobody, but for my era, where I came in at all the movies coming out, now it's Tyler Perry, which I look up to him too as well. But that's you know, that's Tyler Perry wasn't out back then. So it was like, oh man, I like what Spike Lee is doing. But for my genre, genre and um, industry, I looked up to people like George Lucas, you know, the whole Star Wars thing, because that's what I'm doing now. He said the blueprint for what I'm doing, Stan Lee for Marvel, those people paved the way for what I'm doing now. Um, so I would love to work with Stan Lee, God rest his soul, he passed away. But George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, those kind of people, and they older, way older than me, but I, I like, it just come to me. Ryan Coogler is somebody who I would like to work with, you know, from Black Panther, the director that came up with everything. So those kind of people, I'm looking forward to even being in a room with them so they recognize my work and say, hey, what can we do together? But those kind of people that I look up to, and for many reasons, not just for their film, I like how they carry themselves outside of the work. I like, I like their mentality of thinking out the box, you know, and that's, I'm an outside of the box thinker. So definitely Walt Disney. Um, so, you know, when you see my work, you may see stuff like, wow, how do you think of that? People always ask me about gumption. What made you think of that? I'm just thinking outside the box. I'm tired of, I won't use the same superhero powers that everybody else use. Somebody asked me too, why do you want to use ice? So, cause Frozen use ice. And this person and that person, it's like 15 different people that use ice as a superpower. I don't want to use ice. I want to think outside the box and use something else. So that's how I feel about being different and people that I would like to work with and work with me for that reason, because I'm different. Okay. And we're going to take a, a quick little uh, move forward into a segment to help us get to know you as an individual. And then we're going to get more into the projects that you have okay. going on. So this is just a get to know segment. And I'm just going to ask you a series of questions. Some of them are quick response. Some of them you may have to think about, but it just allows us to get to know you a little yes. bit better. So are you ready? Yes. All right. Dogs or cats? I just mentioned cats earlier, huh? Yep. But dogs. I love dogs for whatever reason. Okay. Cats, I got asthma. So well, cats, they got, they shed and dogs do too, but cats, mm, dogs. Okay. Window or aisle seat? window for sure because i'm tall i'm six two um i need to see what's going on um you know windows i gotta see what's going on to be comfortable you know it ain't a scary type of thing but i want to know what, whether it's plane train bus car i need to see what's going on outside that window what book would you give as a gift the bible um for many reasons and it's just not, people got their own religions. I'm not trying to push someone towards my religion, but now I just want to, I want you, whatever religion the person choose, I want them to know how good God is. I want them to read about the miracles and the signs and the wonders, at least think about it, that things in this world is not happening just to be happening. And there's nothing new under the sun. So definitely the Bible. What is your favorite 
recipe to cook or eat. Some that's funny. Like huh? Yeah, definitely. That's funny. Um, and I say that's funny because we talked about my childhood. Um, I learned how to make Rice Krispies in um, middle school. Rice Krispie treats, rather. And um, I make it, I, I that's a good recipe for me. I make it so good. Like my family members, I made it for this church bake sale one day and um, it sold out so quick. I'm like, wow. You know, but yeah, definitely Rice Krispie treats is like one of my, for whatever reason, I don't know, one of my people that people love when I make that. I love it. I would love some Rice Krispie treats. I'm going to have to go yeah. find some just because of this interview. Yeah, I make good <laughs> Rice Krispie treats. What movie could you not resist watching if it came on right now? Mm. Man, so many movies. Um, the Wolf of Wall Street. I know how many people see it's so many movies. I'm a movie fanatic too. I, you know, people around me, they'd be like, You watching that again? I I binge watch like Stranger Things. I keep watching it, keep watching it, take a break for three months, then watch the same series. Because again, like I told you earlier, I'm I'm looking at it from a different lens. I'm thinking while I'm watching. I'm I'm creating in my mind like how I would have did that scene better, the lighting in that scene. But yeah, definitely the Wolf of Wall Street. It's funny. It's about business, and um, it's a true story. Speaking of uh, fun things uh, out of that movie, what makes you laugh the most? Just in something that like oh, you hear it and you're like, God, man, this is hilarious. Dave Chappelle, that's the first person I thought of when you said that. And I always tell people, because there's so many comedians, I said, man, you know, I could be with my friends and family, and they'd be like, why are you not laughing, Jermaine? What? That, it's not funny to me. But when I see Dave Chappelle, I could laugh when I just look at Dave Chappelle, because his looks could make you laugh. And, you know, but shout out to Dave Chappelle. That's somebody I would love to meet, too. But he makes me laugh, a real laugh, not like, uh, that was funny and then going to the next thing like Dave Chappelle makes me laugh okay what is your theme song or what would be your like if you enter a room and this this ring entrance song came on what would it be God did God did and I'm gonna tell you why because so many people that song when I heard that when I first heard that song I said why wow, this song is about my life because it starts off saying they counted us out. They people counted me out. And like I said, I gave you the short form of my life, but if people really counted me out and wrote me off. Um, but that song really describes my life. They counted counted us out. And um, they didn't believe that I would make it, you know, especially with this animation stuff. And, you know, but God did. I said, that's the perfect term. I still use that. I don't care if the song get played out. I'd be like, people didn't believe in me, but God did. God wrote this, even for me to be on with you today. It was all written by God. We've been trying to make this happen, but God said, you're going to do it that day. So I believe everything is, my life is written by God. So I'll say God did. If you could offer yourself one piece of advice, or especially to your younger self, what would that advice be? To never doubt myself. Because it was at, at one point of my life, so much was going on and so many people be in your ear, you begin to doubt sometimes, doubt yourself sometimes. I remember one time I was in, um, like I said, I was in the music business and someone said something to me, we was at a cookout. I still remember this for whatever reason, I still remember this. And, and the guy was like, you ain't gonna, you ain't, you, you play, you ain't finna do nothing in the music business. Like straight dog and me, putting me down. And that kind of stuck with me, that grieved my spirit. Even when I talk about it now, and I'm like, wow, people will break your soul if you let them. So, you know, I would give myself advice, like all the negativity that people may try to break you, use it to, to make you, use it to move forward. They say you can't take one step, take five, take 10. So that's what I would give myself because I believe everything is God's term and God's timing. Because sometimes I'd be like, I stop myself. I say, you know what? I'd be further along if I did this. If I went to animation school in college, if I did this, I would be further along. But that's not necessarily true. Because there's some people that got degrees, that got college degrees, working at McDonald's, working their janitors. They're not even in their field of finance. They just, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. If you just do all these degrees, 
So, you know, I would just give myself that advice. Uh, just all that negativity that may come in, in your path, just look over it, look above it. Wonderful advice. Thank you. I received that too. Uh, even though you're speaking to yourself, I'm listening and like, yeah. Yeah, that's that's good. That's it's always good. for me first. You know, it's always for me first. When I encourage people and I talk to people in a, in a, in a way like that, it's for me first. Why would I tell you if I don't believe it? It's for right. me. It's for me too. Right. And uh, as you talk about, you know, how you move forward and even your mission, I know that you sent me your mission. I just want to read it yes. so that people understand what you are pursuing. You, your mission is to give away thousands of animation school scholarships to students from underserved communities while making an environmental impact with sustainable animation production. And yes. just taking this last little uh, segment just to focus on your company and all that you're doing. So what projects are in the future for you? Great, great question. So the first project that we, we have right now that we released November 1st um, is the Sunday Schoolers Christmas in Heaven movie. And um, you can go to sundayschoolers.net um, and you, then you can go to the link on that to find out where, because right now, we're not putting it on animation TV. We we relaunching. We're doing an official launch to animation TV for spring, um, twenty twenty four. So we're partnering with Prime on the animation uh, Christmas movie, Christmas in Heaven. So that will be our go to the SundaySchoolers.net to kind of find out the, the link to that. We don't have the link yet, but they're going to send it to us soon. Um, so you can go and check that out. It's a full length Christmas movie. It's not like the traditional Christmas movie with reindeers and you know, but it's still fun. You know, it's about Christian life. It's about a group of kids that, you know, instead of asking per se Santa Claus or God or whatever for gifts for them, they ask it for someone else. They want their Sunday school teacher dad to be healed. The whole class come together and say, we're not asking for no Christmas gift. All we asking God for is to heal our Sunday school teacher dad. So, and it's, it's fun, it's Christmassy, it's Christmas songs, and, you know, it's a whole storyline about faith, family, and fun. So that's the sundayschoolers.net. The soundtrack is out now, actually. Um, you know, you can go to Spotify, the Sunday Schoolers, Christmas in Heaven movie soundtrack. It's on Spotify. It's on all the digital platforms. So you can definitely go there. And um, we also have our movie Gumshee that we're working on. We're looking for 2024, November 14th of 2024, uh, Diet World Diabetes Day release uh, for Gumshi. Um, you know, Gumshi is about a 17 year old African American girl who has diabetes. And uh, she's not a diabetic superhero per se. She's just a superhero that has diabetes. So, with all her superhero powers, all her powers that she has to defeat villains, the only power that she, the only thing that she can't really defeat is her diabetes. Her superpowers doesn't work unless her diabetes is controlled. It's maintained. So that's how she's able to help her community. So it's a lesson in that, you know, we we can help ourselves, we can help our situations if we help our health, you know. Um, and it's a whole thing about the whole health equity thing in the movie. And um, it's a great movie. It's a, it's a whole universe that I'm building. Gumshee's just the first movie um, in the whole universe. We had over 20 something superheroes. It's a whole universe, just like Marvel. Like I mentioned, Marvel, they laid the whole blueprint out. So go check out gumshe.com, the website, G-U-M-S-H-E.com, the website. And um, our crowdfunding starts November 1st as well, World Diabetes Month for the whole month. People have been emailing saying, how can we help, Jermaine? We love this. How can we help? What can we donate? I said, I'm sorry. I don't have no donate, donation button on my website or nothing. So now I'm, you know, now I have a way you could donate. You can go to our crowdfunding November 1st. On gumshe.com, you could donate to our crowdfunding. And uh, that would definitely help out because we definitely want to keep control over the IP. You know, we, we could bring it to Hollywood and have them write us a check and then we never see Gumshe again and they make the billions of dollars and we like, why wow, we should have did that. No, we we practice um, philanthropy ship over here, philanthropy ownership over here. And uh, we want to own our IPs and pass it along, generational wealth. You know, so everything that you see come out of small town on the character side, we're going to own. Those are going to be passed down to my children and children's children. Same thing Stan Lee did, same thing George Lucas did over the years, 30, 40, 50 years. 
their family still own those brands. So we're going to do that with Gumshi. But November 1st, go to, to the crowdfunding, uh, gumshi.com uh, to donate and for the, to the crowdfunding. And also the animation, uh, excuse me, the astronaut club is, is a VR curriculum. It's a school curriculum that we're developing, that I'm developing. And in VR, it's 15 missions with a graduation. So it's going to be in all schools and it's going to be in after school programs. It's called the Astronauts Club. It's sort of compared to ROTC, Boys and Girl Scouts, where you got to kind of dress up for the part. And um, it's called the Astronauts Club. You join it, you learn about uh, being an astronaut, mission control, robotics, and everything. And um, 15 missions and, you know, it's graduation. And after that, everybody gets to go to space camp for free. So we have a partnership with space camp. And our mission is to put 50, this is the first mission, is goal rather, is to put 50,000 kids from underserved communities through space camp, you know, through small town animation studios and then our nonprofit, um, you know, which we list on the website, but 50,000 kids, inner city kids uh, through space camp. Some of them kids ain't never been out of their city, never been out of the state but they're interested in stars, astrology, and being an astronaut and being, you know, uh, supervisor at NASA, anything like that. We want to encourage them. And um, that's the goal, 50,000 kids. So we're going to use that IP, which is a 3D animated series, a VR experience. We're going to have merch. We're going to have a drink, the drink for astronauts. It used to be Tang, but it's going to be something else. Um, you know, we'll make that announcement, but just keep going to the astronautclub.com. And um, stay in tune and we make the big announcement about everything. But those are the main three projects. And of course, Animation TV, uh, last but not least, uh, Animation TV, the first Black-owned animation network. And when we say animation network, you know, we're talking about linear channel, 24-hour channel, and a, um, a VOD platform, which is ad-generated, which is very hard to do in this business uh, to get an ad partner. And we thank God for that. We finally got our ad partner for the network. And, you know, and it's, it's official. We do, we did a beta launch, which is a soft launch. And just to kind of get it out there, let people see, hey, this is the kind of content we're going to have. And um, so we pulled it back. We got a new, we're going to have a new partner with that. And the official launch would be uh, March, probably March uh, 2024. We might be trying to discuss now. We might release it with a Easter episode or the Sunday Schoolers. So we're trying to work that out now, but we're on seven platforms. We're on uh, Vita, we're on Samsung, we're on LG, we're on Google, Fire TV. Um, I know I'm missing something, but you can go to animationtv.tv to find out all about that. And we will have merch for everything. So people are asking us about that, the email and saying, how can I get merch and I want to support? So just follow us on our platforms and, you know, all the merge connects and links will be on each one of those platforms. And if you currently look in the show notes, uh, all the links that he just mentioned are currently listed in the show notes. So we want you to, to get connected to everything that he's doing. And I just have one more question for yes. you. Would you like to give some shout outs to loved ones who have been supportive of you on your journey? Now's the time. We go show love to all these awesome people. Yes, um, definitely. Waikita Hargrove, Micah King, Destiny Hargrove, Genesis Hargrove, my mom, Lena, um, my pastor, Randy King, uh, his wife, Prophetess King, his co-pastor. Uh, it's so many people. Um, so Linda Thomas, Deacon Thomas, uh, and I don't want nobody to feel like I'm leaving them out, but these are the people that, you know, kind of was with me from the beginning, beginning stages, believed in me. Not saying nobody else didn't, but these are the kind of people that, you know, stood side, side by side, like through the good and the bad, you know, happy times and tears. So, but um, yeah, definitely my brother, I can't forget him, my brother Maurice Hargrove. Um, my other brother passed away, God rest his soul. Um, so many people that passed away that believed in me too, but I don't want to get too emotional. I start to think about that, but there's a lot of people that that's no longer here. Uh, and I will say, I spoke about my uncle Ronnie early in the conversation. He passed away. It was one of the storms. I don't know if it was hurricane, one of the storms in New Jersey where it was like floods. He worked at the post office 
and he was trying to help somebody in the back door of the post office get in the post office because the the, ride, the water was rising, and then he got dragged out there and died. This is my uncle Ronnie, who I talked about that helped raise me, stay with me and my family. So I definitely want to give him a shout out because I remember one day I told him I said, "Man, like I said, I said, man, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna be nothing." I just felt like that one day. He said. Don't never say that, Jermaine. I don't never want to hear you say that again. He kind of chastised me at that time. And um, to see everything I got going on now, I wish he was here to see that. Like, wow, I took that in when he told me that day. I never said it again. So I definitely want to give him a shout out. My Uncle Ronnie, rest in peace. Yeah, and I know I said that was my last one, but I have to ask one more. Ask on. Yeah, what, no problem. What did you enjoy most about today? To be honest, today felt like a therapy session. You know, only because I'm, I do interviews all the time and these kind of questions they don't care about. <laughs> Actually, they want to know about this business. They want to know about that business. They want to know about this. But like you said, it's a root of all. It's the root of, it's a root of who I am. You know, some like executive asked me one day, Jermaine, where you get your confidence from? You got time for me to tell you? You know, they try to, That's that was a question because they don't know my story. See, you... This feels like the viewers would know my story. Like, so when you see me out speaking, if I got God willing, if I win an Oscar and you hear me say, thank you. I want to say, first of all, I want to thank the Lord. And he's like, oh, I didn't know he was into the Lord. So you're going to know ahead of time, you know, when you start seeing me in these different platforms, if I'm speaking with Oprah, if I'm speaking with Tyler Perry, me and Tyler Perry having a conversation, he was like, oh, I didn't know he was like that. Or you're going to say, oh, I knew he was like that. Oh, he the same way. He would tell it. He would open. He would this person. He the same way because I knew I know the Lord is gonna bring me into these rooms because of what we're doing. You know, it's a purpose. The scripture says I will I will bring you before kings. I don't know the exact scripture, but he said well, the things that you do I will will make room bring you before kings. I know it said your gift will make room for you, but one of the scriptures says I will bring you before kings. And it doesn't necessarily be a king in the king term, but a popular person, a person that's over a bunch of people. So I know that's going to happen. I may make my way to the White House and you hear me talking the same way. I, whether it's Biden or whoever, yeah, I'm talking to them the same way me and you talking now. So, you know, that that's that's what I enjoyed about this conversation. I could be myself. I felt like it was therapy. I, I haven't talked about my Uncle Ronnie in years. And um, I miss him, my brother. I miss him. So when we talk about my childhood, I'm like, wow, I'm thinking back. You know, I don't want to cry when it's, you know, doing this interview, but, and I don't mind crying. I don't mind crying because that's a gift. When you could let it out, when you could, you cry because you appreciate somebody. That's, that's like showing them, a pre you know, I'm talking about happy tears. I ain't talking about, you know, sorrow, but um, I didn't want to cry. So basically I'm like, okay, yeah, this is like therapy to me. And I, I enjoyed this conversation. Well, you certainly touched my heart. I'm over here. I'm I'm, I'm touched by your words and um, thank you thank again you. for just sharing your time with us. And we have come to the end of today's spotlight. Oh, everyone. Man, it's over, huh? <laughs> so, no. <laughs> I this, enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, if, if this podcast has helped you, uh, please share. Be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to Dream of Dre across all social media platforms. And oh, I yeah. am Drea Lewis. Oh okay. yeah, I, I forgot. Good. I forgot about the Be Good Founders. I wouldn't dare. That's how we met. <laughs> I, I wouldn't dare forget them. I'm so sorry. The Be Good Foundation, Beyonce, the Be Good Foundation for Recognize. And I believe it was the only animation company out of all cities selected. So that's definitely a blessing, you know, that she recognized animation, recognize our potential, um, that we want to help the kids and not just kids, but people who want to be inspired, empowered. So definitely the Bay Good Foundation. I want to give them a shout out and thank them as well. Yes. Um, uh, so much to say about Bay Good. I mean, yes. <laughs> here we are. Bay Good has been doing good and will continue to do good. And I'm just thankful yes. uh, that we are here because of Bay Good. But yes, we, uh, we we want to, to say, I just hope that rem that wherever you are i hope that you remember that right now is the perfect time to act on your dreams again yes. thanks again to jermaine thank and you. uh we all we'll see you next time all right everybody take care thank you <laughs>